I think there's a real hunger to have Ohio do better. But will that hunger lead to new leaders when voters head to the polls in less than 100 days? Today, more candidates on the campaign trail pushing to be agents of change for the Buckeye State. They're sick of lifelong politicians. They want something new in Washington, D.C. And advocates for Ohioans with disabilities taking a victory lap after settling a class action lawsuit with Ohio's top elected officials. We feel the system is moving in the right direction, giving people more options for how they live their lives. And a change atop the nation's highest court, just as Stephen Breyer announces his retirement, giving President Biden his first chance to appoint a new justice. Our roundtable discusses that now on The Spectrum. The longest running political show in central Ohio starts now. This is NBC4's The Spectrum with Colleen Marshall. You are seeing the ads and in less than 100 days, you will be voting in Ohio's primary election. Today, two candidates who want your vote tell us why they believe they deserve it. Welcome to The Spectrum, I'm Colleen Marshall. Republican Bernie Moreno, who is in a very crowded GOP primary field, tells us why he is working so hard to replace Senator Rob Portman on Capitol Hill. But first, Ohioans will decide whether Republican Governor Mike DeWine deserves a second term. And today, Democrat Nan Whaley tells you why she believes he does not. It's one of the biggest decisions Ohio voters will make. Who should lead the state from the governor's office? Two high-profile Democrats are in the race, both former mayors, Cincinnati's John Cranley and Dayton's Nan Whaley, who says too many Ohioans feel ignored and forgotten. Too often, the state house and the leaders in the state house, including Governor DeWine, think about this four square block area right around the state house and everybody that's in that you know, lobbyists and special interests and not about like what's happening in East Liverpool or in Dayton or in Cleveland Heights. And so, you know, I think there's a real hunger to have Ohio do better on so many things. Whaley will get a lot of traction from the House Bill 6 scandal, the billion-dollar bailout and bribery scheme tied to First Energy. But the dark money accusations are multi-layered and confusing. Are you finding that people really aren't in tune with what was happening and what it meant for the state? I think I think they didn't know what was really happening when House Bill 6 passed, but I think they know now that they're paying for a corruption tax every single month on their utility bill. So they're being reminded every single month when they pay that utility bill, even if you don't get your energy from First Energy, right? And I think, too, they understand that the, the leaders, including the governor, sold them a bill of goods when they decided to subsidize a coal plant in Indiana. Whaley claims in the state house and in the governor's office, there was political and personal benefit for those who pushed House Bill 6 through. And as voters learn more, she says they'll be appalled and will place some of that blame on Mike DeWine. But to face DeWine in November, she must beat Cranley in May. Cranley told us he plans big economic changes for Ohio, including reaping tax benefits from legalized marijuana. Would you back a plan to legalize marijuana and yes, tax it? Yes, I would. And actually, Dayton was the first city in the state that voted to decriminalize marijuana in our community back in 2018. And even at that time, I said, if I could as mayor legalize it, we would. Uh, so certainly, you know, this is something that uh, has really, uh, all states around us have, have legalized it to tax. And it's a way for us to actually control it better than just letting it be an illegal substance that, frankly, 90% of the population is probably using. Whaley also supports the Ohio Supreme Court ruling that tossed out the Republican-leaning gerrymandered legislative maps. I just hope that Governor DeWine will find the courage to do what's right this time around. What we see over and over again is this play to extreme interests and to protect um, the extreme part of the Republican Party. And certainly there is a huge opportunity for our, our state to be governed in a way that it is, which is really a moderate, you know, common sense kind of state. But we're not seeing that because both of extremists and extreme maps and also because of this political self-dealing we see at the state house every single day. 
Whaley claims she will be working for working families. We're really focused on making sure that one good job is enough for everyone in the state, no matter what zip code you, you live in. You know, too often we see people working harder and harder to get paid less and less. And, you know, I know that personally. I'm the only candidate in this race, Democrat or Republican, that is not a millionaire. You know, I live working class, I'm from the working class, and I've stayed working class. And both me and my lieutenant governor, uh, candidate Cheryl Stevens, we are, we are working class women that are trying to do better for our communities and we can do better for the state. In the race for U.S. Senate, Cleveland luxury car dealer turned tech executive Bernie Moreno picked up the endorsement this week of the National Border Patrol Council, the union that represents Border Patrol agents. The cornerstone of Moreno's campaign is his opposition to illegal immigration. Surprising to some because he is an immigrant. His family came here from Colombia when he was a child. Well, it's a personal issue to me. You know, my family came here 50 years ago. We came here legally. We came here the right way. I took a group of Hispanic uh, leaders with me to the border because most people think that, uh, uh, that this idea of anti-illegal immigration is an anti-Hispanic message. It's actually the opposite. We've been there twice, twice more than Joe Biden. And what you see is just, a, it's, it's very sad. It's the only way I'd say to you, we ran into a Nicaraguan family. Uh, very sad to see what they're going through and what we're encouraging them to leave their family, leave their homes. The 12 year old girls get uh, prescribed birth control pills because they know they're gonna get raped along the way. The women get sexually assaulted as a best case scenario. The men get cavity searched. They get every possession taken from them. We're enriching the drug cartels. That's not good policy. But a lot of people will say your family benefited from having a path to immigration. That path isn't always open anymore, and it's been opposed. Legal immigration has been opposed uh, dramatically by members of your party. So what about giving a path to immigration, legal immigration, that is more easily accessible. Well, no, I've I'm, I'm never uh, been uh, against uh, legal immigration. I, otherwise, we'd be doing this broadcast from South America. So I, I'm all for legal immigration. But we have to agree that there's one path to America. There's a line. We have to wait in line. But we bring a million people into America legally. That's a lot. It's more than any other country on Earth. Well, you mentioned women being raped along the way, men being assaulted. That doesn't that show you how desperate people are to get to this country? Absolutely, which which shows the one thing that the left doesn't want to acknowledge. This is the greatest country on earth. I have I can't tell you how many relatives I have in Colombia. You know, I have 44 first cousins, right? That would love to move to America. They know this is the greatest country on earth, but we can't solve all the world's problems. Moreno is a first-time candidate and acknowledges most polls have former Treasurer Josh Mandel as the front-runner. I think what Josh's polls have shown consistently is that he started here and is dropping. Uh, that's in his poll, our poll, Jane's poll, uh, JD's poll. All the polls kind of tell that same story. He's losing a lot of support. And remember, people know who he is. So when they ask him, you know, you're going to vote for Josh Mandel, they know who he is. In my case, they had no idea who I am. Uh, nine months ago, they would have no reason to. And so we're really happy that uh, the new polls that Kellyanne Conway did put us in third place. That's a, a pretty dramatic accomplishment in six weeks. Like every other Republican in the Senate race in year three of the pandemic, Moreno opposes COVID-19 vaccine and mask mandates. I don't get to decide what goes in your body. But on top of that, from a sales perspective, which I know a couple things about, the best way to convince people is to show them the data, show them the information, and let them and encourage them to make their own decisions. The least effective way to have them make a decision is by bullying them, shaming them, and taking away their rights. Moreno says the mistake in leadership from the beginning was politicizing the pandemic. And he says as he travels the state, he is learning that voters see politicians as the problem. You know, they've been so disappointed from so many politicians that come in, tell them exactly what they want to hear when they want to hear it. They really want to know that you believe the things that you're saying, that you're not fake, that you're genuine, even if they don't agree with you. There's times when I'll say, hey, this is what I believe, and people say, we don't agree with you, but thank you for telling me what you actually believe. And Moreno believes he can be that new voice. I'm not doing this to become famous. I'm not doing this to somehow become wealthy. I've lived the American dream. Sometimes I think maybe God blessed me too much, honestly. Uh, you know, I put a lot of hard work and sacrifice, but I've got to this great spot in America. I have to leave this country better than when I found it 50 years ago. So for me, what I want to do is go down to Washington, D.C. and serve my country and leave it better than when I found it for my kids, my grandkids, your kids, and your grandkids. 
A five year legal fight is over. Up next, why a disability advocacy group says the decision is a big win for Ohio. After a five year federal court fight, Disability Rights Ohio is claiming a win in its effort to get intellectually and developmentally disabled Ohioans into independent housing. The group filed the class action lawsuit against then Governor John Kasich and state and county agencies that deal with the disabled. They came away with a settlement agreement that's now been approved by a federal court. Disability Rights Ohio set out to help people living in segregated institutional facilities find a way into community housing. Since March of 2016, we know that approximately 1,300 people um, who were in residential facilities are now living in the community. He points to success stories like one of the plaintiffs who's now in an apartment has a job after years of living in a facility. Become economically self-sufficient and decide what his day look like and make his own decisions, make his own choices. So um, that's a story that, that sticks out to me. Really proud of our work and, and his participation in this lawsuit, like fighting for his own rights and fighting for the rights of other people. I remember talking with some family members while this litigation was still pending who said they didn't want your interference, that the reality is they are guardians for their loved ones and they didn't want you coming in and making decisions without their input. Do you think they had a point? Not every person, not every family who has a loved one in a facility wanted their loved one to move out. And so the settlement agreement is a compromise, right? Like it increases the capacity of the system to serve people in community-based settings instead of facilities, but also respects the choice of families who want to keep their loved one in facilities. And now the state of Ohio is charged with increasing capacity for community care. A Supreme Court justice is stepping down. Our roundtable reacts next. In our roundtable this week, we have the president and CEO of Innovation Ohio, Desiree Timms, and Republican strategist Bob Clegg. And this week, Justice Breyer announced that he is stepping down. Not a big surprise. He is 83. Desiree, is this a mandate for Joe Biden to appoint a black woman to the court? Justice Breyer leaves behind a long legacy, um, something that he and we all can be very proud of. Today, I am absolutely thrilled that Joe Biden announced that there would definitely be a black woman um, nominated to the Supreme Court, a campaign promise that he has pledged to fulfill. And I look forward to seeing a number of qualified candidates rise to the occasion and rise to the top of that list. But I think I speak for black women everywhere when I say we are really excited about another opportunity to make history. And Bob, what, what do you think your party, some people already giving pushback to that? Uh, at this point, though, in year two, there really is no way to block whoever he appoints, correct? Correct. Um, I think the timing of this is interesting. I think it kind of shows uh, maybe the lack of, 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 on the Democrats' parts, of believing that they're going to hold the Senate after this November. So I think that's why they're going to hurry up on this. And number two, the one thing Joe Biden's got to be careful of here is that he's got to make sure he picks somebody that is going to be okay with the real president of the United States, Joe Manchin. Uh, and that is true, Desiree. Uh, Democrats right now really have had their programs being determined in somewhat by cinema, but really by Senator Manchin, right? Joe Manchin announced and released a statement that he would support a Supreme Court candidate and nominee who was more liberal than he. And so I think we can rest assured that Joe Manchin is going to support the president of the United States in his decision to nominate a qualified black woman to the Supreme Court. We also heard from Senator Lindsey Graham, who's supporting a black woman a judge in South Carolina. So I think we have an opportunity to really um, cast a wide net here. And, and the reality is, Bob, for your party, this is not going to change the makeup of the court. It's still going to be a 6-3 conservative court. Yeah, that's why I don't, I don't see any really big fight on this. Um, it's, you know, it's become 
more and more the norm that you don't pull any votes from the other party when a Supreme Court nominee is 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 put forward. But I mean, you could have a situation where uh, Lisa Murkowski or a Susan Collins might uh, vote for uh, uh, a nominee that President Biden puts forward. I mean, it's not unheard of, but usually it's Republicans that do that, not Democrats. You know, I also want to ask you about some polling that came out this week that uh, interesting uh, in the governor's race. First, on the Republican side, and keep in mind these poll numbers were released by Jim Renacci, who is challenging Governor DeWine. The former congressman says polling shows that he is ahead of Mike DeWine. Some people will be startled by that. Bob, are you startled by that? Do you think that's realistic? Uh, I don't know if it's realistic. I mean, I've heard rumblings out there uh, in, in with Republicans about Mike DeWine and the way he handled COVID. But I think the bottom line on this is most of the people still haven't made up their minds in, in that race. So I, I don't think this is something that's set in stone. I think it's going to be very fluid. And with the uh, announcement by Intel uh, coming into Ohio, I think that's going to help the governor a lot. It creates uh, uh, thousands of jobs, and it's a great economic boost for Ohio. That was a big win for the governor. Really, Democrats are taking some credit for that as well. It's a big win for the state of Ohio. But Desiree, when you see the Republicans battling for an incumbent governor who's so well known, like Mike DeWine, are you surprised by those poll numbers, the Renacci numbers? We've heard a lot of buzz for the last several months about the Republican uh, Party and the extreme members of the party and what's happening right now. I think what this does spell is it spells trouble for the governor. It appears as if he is a vulnerable opponent, not just in the general election, but in the primary election. So um, we'll see. Yeah, and let me ask you about this, Desiree, because Nan Whaley on the Democrat side is also out with some poll numbers. Now, Nan Whaley, the mayor of Dayton, endorsed by the, what I guess you would call the mainline Democrats, including Sherrod Brown. Her polling is showing her ahead of John Cranley, the mayor of Cincinnati. So is that what you expect to see, or do you expect this to be a heated race? I think... Uh, we have a battle of the mayors, <laughs> and I'm a Dayton girl myself, and so really excited about the opportunity to eventually have women in positions of leadership um, like Nan Whaley. I think uh, the mayor of Cincinnati and the mayor of Dayton are, are really good friends and are going to battle, battle it out, and this is why we have primaries. I think we'll see a lot more coming out of this campaign and this camp, and it's going to be an exciting election year if we can finally get some districts and get our deadlines straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if we could figure out where everybody's going to be running from. But Bob, on the Democratic side, Dan Whaley, John Cranley, they're expected to be a little more civil than some of the people running on the Republican ticket. Are, are you surprised to see that Whaley's ahead? No, because if you look at the at more information question that, that she includes in her poll, She's trying to make uh, Mayor Cranley look like a liberal progressive. And I think Nan Whaley understands that she won't have a chance. Well, she won't have a chance, period, in Ohio. But she won't have a real chance if you come, come in a general election with that liberal progressive bent. And I think, she, and I think she's right. She's going to have a better chance of winning a Democrat party as a more moderate establishment Democrat than she would as a progressive Democrat. It's, a, it's also noteworthy that so many people in that poll have not made up their minds. And Desiree is a problem that really neither Nan Whaley nor John Cranley have that statewide name ID like you would expect for someone like Mike DeWine. I think the name ID comes with fundraising, with getting your message out, with hitting the ground and raising awareness about all the good that they both contributed to Southwest Ohio. So I think that we'll hear a lot more from the Democratic candidates for governor in the coming months and a lot of excitement. I push back on the progressive narrative. We have a progressive senator in Sherrod Brown, and I think the people of Ohio are ready for progressive politics and progressive candidates and progressive companies like Intel. All right, well, we thank both of you for being with us this morning. We're gonna be right back. Next week, Congressman Troy Balderson and I break down the items that could survive as the Democrats revive their Build Back Better agenda. And former Governor John Kasich about his new unique media gig. Those stories next Sunday on The Spectrum.